Right. So um, we looked at uh, verse 10 onwards. So here, Paul is uh, addressing the Corinthian church and he's actually literally pleading with them, begging them, beseeching them. And um, and what is the uh, what is the reason for him to do that? He's saying, I plead with you that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So um, three things, or uh, at least three main things that he mentions there, that he says, you know, you all speak the same thing um, about your belief, about what about our faith, and about us as a people of God, you speak the same thing. Um, second thing, he says, let there be no schisms or uh, divisions, which means that uh, let there be no split, let there be nothing that separates us from each other uh, concerning our faith. Uh, let there be nothing that brings a division among us. Okay, So he says, uh, you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together. So first two things he says, you know, let there be, you speak the same thing, let there be no divisions. And thirdly, he says, you be perfectly joined together. Okay, and the word used there is that uh, it gives us a picture of a broken bone. You know, suppose you have a fracture, the bone being put together in a cast or placed together so that it will heal. Like, so you be perfectly joined together, right? Even if there was a split, even if there was a fracture, uh, let there be healing, that you be perfectly joined together. And in what? In the same mind and in the same judgment. Uh, so he's like, um, in your understanding, in your, uh, in your, uh, you know, same judgment. In meaning, if if it's your, uh, your view, your opinion, you know, come to that uh, place of uh, same uh, judgment. Be of one mind. Okay. Now, we know that God has. Uh, created each one of us differently, uniquely. We all have our likes. We all have our dislikes. Okay, so it's not talking about those. But the fact is that um, when it comes to the matters of the faith, when it comes to us being united as a, as a people of God, as a, as a church, as the body of Christ, um, you know, he's, he's, he's what Paul is saying, encouraging is that you come to a place, you make a choice, you make an effort to be united, which means that sometimes you need to, you know, give way. Sometimes you need to, you know, sacrifice, but you make a choice so that you can prevent division, find out what is it that's dividing, prevent that and come to a place of unity. So here, what has what has happened is that um, uh, there has been disunity, there has been uh, certain divisions. So therefore, Paul has to uh, address that. And the thing is that he has received news, and while at Ephesus, obviously he has received news from Chloe's household. Okay, so uh, uh, Chloe's uh, the uh, the ho household the. Uh, uh, of Chloe had uh, actually heard uh, it could it could even be a church that was meeting there in uh, Chloe's uh, house we, we don't know but but the fact is that uh, Chloe was also part of the Corinthian church and uh, was concerned about what was going on in the Corinthian church and uh, among the believers and uh, so she uh, along with the others reached out to Paul and said you know uh, there's something that is unhealthy and uh, and so Paul writes in response to that right so um, so what is it what was happening there you know, verse 11 for it has been declared that there are contentions among you okay so uh, there are divisions there are contentions that they are quarreling there are quarrels and divisions and quarrels among you and this is the nature of the contention. This is the nature of the quarrel. Verse 12 onwards. You know, we, we saw that uh, Corinth, Corinth was a place where Apollos also ministered, right? So uh, Apollos also, like uh, when we read Acts chapter 17, I think, or 18, 
we read that uh, Apollos was there um, and uh, he, um, sorry, I, I think it was in verse, uh, sorry, Acts chapter uh, yeah, 17. Um, sorry, uh, 19. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 19, we read about how Apollos was there in uh, when when Paul was in Corinth, Apollos was there ministering, and then after that, um, uh, Paul goes to um, uh, you know uh, he goes to Corinth and so on from Ephesus. So um, so we see that Apollos was also someone who was ministering there. So now people were taking sides. What were they saying? Verse twelve: I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas or Peter. So this was what was happening. They were elevating the person, the minister, who had come there to minister to them, serve them. And uh, they were comparing. Okay, They were comparing um, the servants of God. And they were taking sides. And they were saying, okay, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas. So, so Paul is saying, you know, is Christ divided? Okay, is Christ divided? You know, uh, there is no division. So was Paul crucified for you? You know, so he's saying, you know, we are all preaching the same Christ. So it was it was not Paul who was crucified. Uh, and he goes on to say, you know, oh, where you baptized in the name of Paul? You know, just think about it. You know, I am a person who ministered to you, uh, but it's actually about Christ. Right? Um, that's the bigger picture. So there's no reason for us to be divided based on the one whom God sent to minister. So they were, uh, you know, of, with a false sense of, um, uh, I don't know, with a false sense of faithfulness to the person who had come to minister or uh, of, they were elevating the man unnecessarily. They're elevating the, the person or the minister, uh, servant unnecessarily. And as a result of that, there was division in the church. So another important lesson for us, you know, that when we elevate the man or the woman, the minister, way beyond, you know, yes, we need to honor, we need to acknowledge, honor the person, respect the person. But when we elevate, then there it results in division. Right in the church, so so this is what um, so Paul says, you know, um, and he says, you know, I didn't baptize any of you uh, except uh, household of Stephanas and so on. So he mentioned those names, and then he goes on to say in verse seventeen, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Okay, so. I did not come with, you know, with a lot of wisdom and with the wisdom of words, uh, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. You know, I didn't want to, you know, use my wisdom or the wisdom of words in order to take the focus uh, away from the cross. Okay, so uh, first of all, he says, you know, let there be no divisions. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? He, he, he will actually, in the second chapter, and, and, and in the church, third chapter, he addresses that again. Right? He comes back to the uh, to this topic of division. He comes back to this thing of uh, 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 contentions, and he addresses that again. Okay. So then, uh, verse eighteen, Paul goes on to talk about the importance of the cross, the message regarding the cross which was preached he's talking about the importance of that um because in verse 17 he says you know um i did not come to baptize but to preach the gospel and i did and even when i preached the gospel it was not with uh, words of you know human wisdom okay uh, not with wisdom of words sorry not with wisdom of words um less the focus should be on the words or on the wisdom and the eloquence and the ability, human ability, and you leave the focus off the cross of Christ. Now, I don't want that to happen, but I wanted you to focus on the cross of Christ because it is important. And he goes on to explain why he 
ministered in such a way and what is the importance of the cross okay verse 18 onwards for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of god for it is written i will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent where is the wise and where is the scribe where is the disputer of this age has not god made foolish the wisdom of this world for since in the wisdom of god the world through wisdom did not know god it pleased god through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe for jews request a sign and greeks seek after wisdom but we preach christ crucified to the jews a stumbling block and to the greeks foolishness but to those who are called both jews and greeks christ the power of god and the wisdom of god because the foolishness of god is wiser than men and the weakness of god is stronger than men okay so he goes on to um, you know explain about the cross and about the power of the cross so verse 18 is the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing you know to the world outside which does not consider christ the message seems to be foolish because they are talking about a person who died on the cross and who carried something called sin of the world upon himself he died and on the third day he rose again uh, and uh, and it seems to be weird it seems to be foolishness it goes beyond logic human understanding you know if you look at um, uh, the book of acts we see the response of the ones who were in uh, in Athens right acts chapter um acts chapter 19 and um, i'm sorry uh acts chapter 17 and verse 16 okay so paul is at athens he's waiting for timothy and silas to join him and he sees that the city was given over to idols and uh, so uh, he meets these philosophers you know there's this place the marketplace and also this place called areopagus or mars hill and so he he meets with them he speaks to them and uh, you know th- they were actually meeting and talking about new things exchanging ideas and so on and uh, he he talks to them um verses 22 to 20 uh, till the end of the chapter Uh, it's it's actually about his address to those people you know what he the message that he preaches uh, that paul preaches to the people who are gathered there in that place called mars hill or areopagus um and he sees this altar with an inscription to the unknown god so he uses that and uh, from there he shares uh, the gospel right but listen to the you know some of them heard and uh, they uh, some said okay I, we want to hear this again okay, we are curious now we want to hear you again about this but others they mocked and the reason was this you know verse 32 and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead some mocked okay so they heard this in this this about the resurrection of the dead they heard this about uh he you know in when verse 17 or verse 18 you see that uh, uh he preached to them jesus and the resurrection so uh, paul very clearly uh talked to them about the lord jesus talked to them about resurrection from the dead and and when they hear it they mock okay so it seems to be foolishness the message of the cross it seems to be uh really you know so easy sometimes i remember when um you know i was growing up and i was in this part of this youth group uh growing up and uh, every sunday we used to meet have a time of worship fellowship uh, study from the word and uh, that particular sunday we would i think uh, i forget the message but i think it was about the cross and and so there came a person who who was not a believer but he was you know uh, of a different world view but he he was there with us and and after the after hearing the message on grace uh, and how you we just need to receive it 
by grace. Right? We just need to receive, believe in what was done on the cross and receive it. He said, uh, you know, how can it be so easy? Right? How can it be so easy? How can I, you know, I, because he was of the opinion that, um, oh, you have to do certain things. You have to do this. You have to keep this. You have to, you know, travel to this place, visit this place, you know, put your body to the test and, and uh, you know, forego certain things and then achieve something, you know, achieve this salvation. But when he heard this message, it was so simple. The simplicity of the message seemed so foolish. And the simplicity of believing what the Lord Jesus did so many years ago and the fact that when we believe, we receive something, um, the benefit of what he did for us on the cross. And uh, there's change that happens because of that. There's, uh, you know, uh, the, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells. And all that seemed to be foolish. Okay. So he said, it's, it's too easy. Uh, it, and it seems, so even today, the message of the cross is foolishness. Uh, as, uh, you know, people who are perishing and who do not acknowledge Christ and they don't want to receive, it, it seems to be foolish. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. So the message of the cross is the power of God. Okay, the gospel is the power of God. Romans chapter 1, um, if you look at that uh, scripture, um, Romans 1 and... Uh, Verse 16, uh, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also for the Greeks. So it is the power of God. This, this gospel, this salvation message, which is about the cross, what happened on the cross, and it's about the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. It involves all that. It is the power of God. So Paul is saying that I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God. So we know that it takes the power of God to break, to break the power of sin. It takes the power of God to break the power of sin. Therefore, uh, it, is, it is the cross, uh, the power, which is the power of God. And then when we say the it, the, it is a cross or the message of the cross is the power of God. It's not just about the symbol. Okay, We need to understand that also. It's not about having the symbol of the cross uh, maybe around our neck or, you know, no harm. You know, if you somebody is wearing a cross and, uh, you know, somebody has a cross at home, uh, there's no problem. No problem with that. But the fact is that it is the message of the cross, which is the power of God. We need to understand that, right? Okay, so verse 19 and 20. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And he asked certain questions, right? rhetoric. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Okay, and verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Okay, so um, through wisdom, through human wisdom, the world cannot know God. Right? It takes the revelation of the Holy Spirit and the foolishness of this message to really start to begin that journey to know God. Because you are born again, and then you understand the Holy Spirit, He takes off, off that veil which was there on our hearts. He He reveals things to us. It, and then, you know, progressively we begin to understand God. Oh, yes, this is the love of God. This is the nature of God. Um, we begin to understand the great spiritual truths. In, but then it starts with that uh, first step, right? So the world through the wisdom, through you know various means, trying to know God, trying to reach out, um, it, does not, it did not know God. It does not know God still. Right? And it pleased God through the foolishness of this message preached to save those who believe. So it was, it seems to be foolish and it was, but the fact is that through this, 
people are being saved lives are being changed uh, people's destinies are being changed and uh, lives are being transformed and paul himself you know uh, can uh, is a testimony of that right so we uh, when we read about paul's life we see that um, you know he persecuted the jews i mean so he persecuted the the christians those who are the followers of christ and he was very very passionate about that he would take letters of permission to put christians in prison that um, you know so he was going from place to place and and the bible when we when we read read about it in in the in the book of acts we see that he made havoc of the church um and so much so that um when when he became a believer you know there was so much of peace in the church um we see that uh, people are saying those who you know the man who persecuted actually is now uh is now preaching right um acts chapter 8 verse 3 as for Saul he made havoc of the church like so Paul who was Saul he made havoc of the church entering every house dragging off men and women committing them to prison okay so you see that as soon as he heard that there were people who were worshiping Jesus he would go to their homes find out drag them off put them in prison put them in prison right and we don't know what kind of justice it was there um, probably people did not see their family members later uh, we don't know like families were separated and so on but the fact is that uh, that kind of a person came to christ right this person came to christ through an encounter with christ and he uh he, he, you know he 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 started preaching christ okay so this is what we read acts chapter 9 and verse 31 then the churches throughout all judea galilee and samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the lord and in the comfort of the holy spirit they were multiplied and the verses before that say that he spoke boldly in the name of the lord jesus who spoke boldly the apostle paul such was his transformation and when he his life was transformed it says that there was peace in the church because he was such a terror and how did this transformation happen you know he had this encounter and uh, with christ and the the foolishness of the gospel completely transformed him the foolishness of the message completely transformed him right um so god in his wisdom this is what he instituted right verse 22 for jews request a sign and the greeks seek after wisdom but we pray we preach christ crucified to the jews a stumbling block and to the greeks foolishness but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God okay so the Jews uh, very spiritual in their approach very spiritual in their uh, people with a lot of spiritual hunger so they were seeking after sign the supernatural the miraculous they request a sign and when we contrast that with the the greeks the greeks were learned very highly intellectual um those who uh, were logical in their reasoning and who gave a lot of importance to thinking and so you know there were a lot of philosophers and um and so on so the greeks were interested in things that that really you know appeal to their wisdom and intellect so the jews seek a sign the greeks go after wisdom and paul says but we preach christ crucified okay irrespective of uh, whether the audience is jews uh, audience is uh, you know are the greeks we preach this message because this message of the cross is the power of god we preach christ crucified and he says you know um to the jews it comes out across as a stumbling block you know they're not able to accept you know, 
is Christ the Messiah? You know, is he the one? Uh, and uh, how can salvation uh, be apart from the law? You know, to the Jews, a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, it seems to be foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. But to those who are who called, who respond to the invitation. So that is what it means, right? It's Everyone is called, but to those who respond to that call, uh, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So both the power and the wisdom they experience, which means both the signs, the miraculous, and the answers, and the intellectual quest, you know, the, the, the knowledge and the, and the questions are satisfied in Christ. Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So the, the wisdom that people are longing for, the, the supernatural and the miraculous that people are, you know, are searching for, it's actually found in Christ. Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So you experience the power and you receive the wisdom and the answers to the uh, quest for, you know, if you could call it quest for enlightenment. It begins and ends with Christ. Okay. So, so that is the foolishness of the message, please. So we, you know, many times we we, we ourselves might think about the gospel and everything, and it seems such a simple message. You know, will lives be changed? It seems like such a, uh, you know, such a, uh, it seems to be foolishness. Will lives be transformed? The answer is yes, because Christ, the power of God, to those who believe, right, to, those who be, to those who are called, those who is in, 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 receive that foolish message, to those who believe, Christ, the uh, wisdom of God and the power of God. Then he goes on um, to verse 26. Okay, so before we go on to verse 26 and to the rest of the chapter, any any questions um, based on what we, or any thoughts that you want to share? Anything that you want to share that, uh, you know, you, you understood and you felt? Um, anything that you want to share? You can do that as well. Or anything that you noticed here that you had not seen before. You know, is there anything like that? Um, anything that you noticed in this chapter one that you had not noticed before, earlier times when you, you know, when you read that? Um, you can say, share that also. Yeah. See, one thing of uh, before we progress further. Uh, one thing that we notice is that uh, you know there seems to be a lot of problems in the church. Okay, so Chloe's household, they have actually informed Paul, and uh, it was obviously through a letter, through a through a you know note which would have come to him. People would have come, traveled, and given, and uh, they seem to have listed down certain things. But if you see uh, the way Paul addresses the church. Uh, it is with a lot of grace. It is with a lot of uh, respect. And he also says that he thanks God for the grace of God upon them. Like he continues to thank God for the grace of God upon them. So um, one of the things that we can, you know, in our own lives and probably in the lives of others is that we can, when we see the work of God, okay, there could be many other things that are, not developed, that are not mature. Okay, so we um, we see some believers, or maybe we see some people who are not yet mature in you know certain areas. Okay, and um, and they, but they are sincere, but they are you know not mature. And when we when we see them sometimes ministering, we you know there is a sense of um, uh, there is a sense of sadness. There is a sense of you know maybe sometimes we are annoyed, irritated, angry, right? But the fact is that Paul continues to thank God for the for some of the good things that are happening. The fact that they were enriched, uh, the fact that they were spiritual, and 
the fact that the uh, they fell short of no gift and uh, utterance and knowledge and so on so he gives thank he acknowledges that he notices that and he acknowledges that and he gives thanks to god for that okay um and he also chooses to address the problems the challenges the things that were going wrong he chooses to address that as well okay. so that is something that we see uh, uh that's something that we can learn as maybe leaders as, as uh, spiritual leaders as ministers of god sometimes it's 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 very difficult right it's very difficult to see that good thing because there's so much of the bad which is uh, i'm talking about believers okay we are, we're talking about believers we're not talking about people who do not know god we're talking about people who are believers maybe they are which maybe they are you know believers for many years and we see their lives and we see that there are things in their lives which um which they are continuing on which are not glorifying god uh, and we see that uh, you know that the fact that uh, we notice that and we're not able to appreciate god's work in their lives right but the fact is paul sees that and he sees the good things that the lord has done um so that is something for us to learn when we look at some person you know what is the good thing that god is doing in their lives okay so we can appreciate thank god for that praise god for that that good thing which god is doing in their lives well there are several things that are not doing they are they are doing wrong and they are not going right in their lives those things we can pray uh, to the lord and if we know these people personally we can actually address that bring it to their notice and address that to them yeah there's something that we uh, learn okay so prince uh, has a question verses uh uh was 19 and 20 right okay so was 19 and 20 uh, i'm just going back um so where uh, paul writes and he says for it is written i will um destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent obviously these are uh, the words of uh, words of god in uh, and he's referring to uh, isaiah 29 i think um yeah 29 14 and so he's uh, referring to that um he's kind of paraphrasing and quoting that um and uh, you know uh, where god says you know i will do a uh, get a marvelous work um among this people a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden so he's kind of uh, you know referring to that old testament scripture and um, and he's saying you know for it, this is what is written that god will destroy the wisdom of the wise or you know what is so called wisdom you know god will destroy that and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent you know in this plan of salvation if you look at the verse he's saying god will do a mar- marvelous work a marvelous work and a wonder so uh, and god did that uh, through uh, this um whole work of salvation and uh, verse 20 when paul says you know where is the wise where is the disputer it's it's actually a you know uh, it it's a what we call a rhetoric question you know in the sense he's not he's not looking for answers there but he's actually saying you know uh, is is anyone wise is anyone who's disputing is anyone you know where is the scribe you know don't you know that god has made the foolish the wisdom of this world You know, the, now these are people you know the wise these are uh, the the scribe uh, the disputer of this age or someone who is arguing and debating uh, you know these truths so he is kind of calling out no hey where are you you know the the disputer of the age the, the scribe where are you you know god has made foolish the wisdom of the wise in this whole gospel in this message of the cross through this message of the cross may actually made foolish all this so so that is what uh, he is referring to it's actually a what we call as a rhetoric statement you know like uh, like paul says in 1 corinthians 14 and i think sorry 12 and verse 28 where he says you know uh, are all apostles or all you know prophets are all so uh, the answer is no right so uh, so he's asking that question because the uh, to emphasize the fact that the answer is no 
So here, again, when he, when he asks uh, such a question, uh, where he's saying, where is the wise? Where is the disputer? Uh, so he's pointing to the fact that the wisdom of God is greater than the wisdom of man, or the what we call as the foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of man. Right? Does that help, Prince? Okay. Uh, do you have any other question? Okay. Fine. Uh, okay. Others? Uh, right. Any other question? Any other thought? Yeah, Prince? Okay. Okay, nothing right now. So we'll, we'll just move on to um, the rest of the verses. Okay. So, um, from verse 26 um, till the end of the chapter, so Paul, uh, Paul says, you know, he, he shifts the, uh, the focus uh, to the people and he's saying, you know, um, he's continuing the same thought, of course, and he's saying, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, according to human standards, according to flesh, fleshly standards, not many wise um, according to the flesh, not many mighty not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things that are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glorifies, let him glory in the Lord. Okay. He who glorifies, let him glory. He, he, sorry, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So he he asks them, you know, uh, he asks them, he says, you know, just look at your own lives that, uh, you know, look at your calling. And uh, now that you've come to Christ, look at your own lives. Not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. In other words, what he's saying is that, uh, you know, the, the, this gospel, uh, this gospel message and the calling and everything is not based on whether people are wise according to human standards or people of great strength, physical, mental, whatever, uh, you know, physical strength. Um, and also people, you know, God doesn't call them based on their background whether they are noble, uh, whether, you know, I'm just saying, you know, whether they are maybe uh, royalty, God doesn't look at that and call them, okay? So that does not mean that, okay, suppose a person is wise, that that excludes that person. That does not mean that suppose a person is a strong, you know, it, it, well, there were people who were, in fact, Paul himself was a great intellectual person of his age, and he, you know, he was learned man, he was mighty uh, in scriptures and so on. Apollos, again, we read that, uh, the fact that he was, uh, you know, he's very articulate, he was mighty in the scriptures and so on, right? So, so it's, it's, it's not talking about that. Right? Saying that God's basis or the basis of his invitation or basis of the call is not based on these standards. Okay? It's not based on the fleshly standards. But God has really chosen even the foolish things, like the, the foolish things of the world. And because of his power and because of the power of the gospel, the power of the message of the cross, to put to shame the wise. Okay? God has chosen the weak things. You know, if you look at uh, the disciples, uh, we see that you know, they were not people of great learning. You know, uh, there were people of great learning also. But the ones who, uh, you know, they, the, the ones who actually went about and uh, changing the world upside down are the ones who were obedient. 
like the ones who who uh, who were obedient, who were sincere, who responded to the call. Right? So God is saying God has chosen the foolish things of the world, and uh, He chose people from you know from various background, varied backgrounds, and with this message, right? Uh, they were actually put to shame. The wise were put to shame. And uh, it says that um, the base things of the world. Okay, um, so God, you know, in human eyes, it could be like certain people could be undervalued, okay, or not not given any value at all. Okay, maybe people of learning and great understanding, and maybe people who appear good looking. You know, these are people who get noticed, right? Human standards. Uh, I say, wow, this person has come. Oh, he's a politician. Oh, he's a film star. Oh, he's a sports person. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you're traveling and then if there are sports person or film stars there, then, you know, everybody's running. I you know, I need to get their autograph, get to get, to get their photograph and, and so on. So, um, you know, people are drawn to that normally. Okay. Uh, drawn to special abilities, drawn to these things. But not so with God. Okay. Uh, saying that God, you know, what seems to be foolish, what seems to be weak, what seems to be or uh, people who are not really respected and valued. And we see that in the ministry of the Lord, Lord Jesus, the tax collector. The tax collector was not really, uh, you know, people like Zacchaeus. Um, we are not respected by the Jews of the age because they were considered to be people who were uh, you know, faithful to the Romans and the uh, Roman, um, the the leaders, and therefore they were considered to be traitors. And but the Lord Jesus, he looks to Zacchaeus and he says, you know, today I must, I must come to your house. And Zacchaeus has a change of heart, right? So we see that what seems to be not valued by human standards, um, God has a different. Uh, scale of measurement altogether, right? So uh, it says you see that uh, people who are weak, foolish, not valued, well, they were chosen by God and uh, because of the gospel, because of the power of God in them and through them, through them, uh, he changed. He brought to nothing the wisdom of the voice. Okay, and and the fact is that it is the power of God, it is the work of God that no flesh should glory in his presence. Verse 29. No flesh should glory in his presence. I cannot say that, you know, even as a person who's, who's ministering or who's serving God, um, we cannot say it's it's because of my great ministry or it's because of, you know, uh, the abilities, the special abilities, because without God, these are nothing. Right? Uh, it comes from God. Yes, the abilities and, and the anointing and the giftings and everything He gives, it comes from Him. But without Him, these are these are nothing, right? Uh, without God's work in our hearts, uh, without um, uh, us depending on Him, these are nothing. So, uh, so He says that uh, that no flesh should glory in His presence. No flesh should glory. Yeah, you know, take pride uh, upon one's accomplishments or achievements. No flesh should do that. Verse 30, but of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Okay, but of him, uh, which means that of um, the, uh, the Lord, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus because of his initiative, because of his work, uh, because of his work on the cross and uh, because, you know, uh, of your response to that, obviously, there's you are in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus. Um, you are spiritually one with him and you are in Christ Jesus, connected with Christ. And, you know, remember John chapter 15, that, uh, you know, he's the vine, we are the branches, and you know, we are connected with him. So the life of Christ flows in us. What is in God flows in us because of that one thing, 
right? Because of the work of the cross and our response to the work of the cross. So here, you are in Christ Jesus, who became from us, who who uh, became for us wisdom from God. Okay, so God's wisdom, righteousness, righteousness, being right with God. And uh, being right, um, come to a place of uh, being right with God. Righteousness, the, the very nature being changed. Righteousness and the sanctification and redemption. His sanctification, being set apart from the world, set apart from all uncleanness, all filth, set apart, uh, having a different uh, uh, consecrated life altogether. So, and sanctification and Redemption, okay. Uh, redemption, being redeemed from what we were held by, what we were slaves to, redeemed, right? So, in Christ, He became for us all this, which means He did all this for us. Uh, made sure that we have access to the wisdom of God. Uh, made sure that uh, that we are clothed with His righteousness. That all our unrighteousness were taken away, and He made sure that He clothed us with this uh, uh, with His righteousness. Made sure that we were sanctified, set apart for His purposes, and also that we were redeemed. Christ became this for us, and Christ did this work in us. And that, as it is written, He who glorifies, let Him glory in the or, you know, if you want to sing praises, if you want to boast about something, you glorify the Lord. You glory in the Lord. Now, again, we need to uh, uh, we need to remember why he is saying this. Like these are great spiritual truths, deep truths, um, which talk about the message of the cross, which talk about the power of the cross, and uh, you know what it does in people's lives. The reason he's sharing this is because of. That information that he received from Chloe's household, of course, um, about division, about the fact that they were people were fighting with one another, people were uh, divided in the church, and they were saying, "I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos." So Paul is saying, you know, no one can glory in oneself. So he's saying, you know, yeah, we're all people of God. But the message of the cross, don't forget, the message of the cross, that's the important thing because that is what has the power to change. Right? That is the power of God, the message. And not the messenger or what the messenger does. Yes, God does use people and God does convey the message to the people. God does minister. But it is about the power of God. right? And he goes on to contrast between the wisdom of man the wisdom of God, the foolishness of man, uh, and the foolishness of what do you, what we can call as the foolishness of God uh, against the wisdom of God, um, uh, against the wisdom of man, and uh, and the strength, um, uh, you know, and the wisdom of sorry, the, what is called verse twenty five, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Okay, so with that, uh, we come to the end of this chapter. But we, we should always remember the context. You know, why is he saying this? Um, as we, it, from time to time, you know, we uh, it, these are great, uh, you know, revelatory truths by uh, by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Spirit of God. And Paul is making known to the Corinthian church, not only to the Corinthian church, like we said, you know, it's it's to the saints. To the you know the body of Christ, to us in this day and age, it's still applicable. And um, and, and the thing is this: what sets it off is is this. So he's addressing, he's putting things in perspective. He's just saying, okay, you know, what is man? What is God? The ministry of man, um, and you know, uh, and the, and the fact that man is always dependent on God, and the fact that one cannot glory in man. So when I say I'm I'm of Paul. Or you know, I belong to this great uh, group. Uh, we are actually putting down, or you know, bringing down the message of the cross or the power of the cross. We are saying this is greater, something greater. Right? So uh, that always divides uh, the church. Okay, so we'll stop here. And any questions or any thoughts that you want to share, uh, you can do that. Okay. 
Right. Okay, if there are no um, questions, I think we'll we'll stop right here, and uh, we'll meet again and uh, in our next class in our next session.